It's 10th of January, 1926, and at Freeville, New York, youthful residents of the town are active members of smallest republic in the world. It's almost voting time in campaign for new president. And on election day, the voters are all between 16 and 21 years of age. It's great training for the real thing. 10th of January is also inauguration day for little government's newly elected chief executive. And here's honored youth himself taking oath of office. Complete with police force and even a jail, George, Junior Republic, is fully prepared to handle all lawbreakers. But there's trial by judge and jury, and witnesses to evil deeds are heard answering questions of youthful lawyer by a duly chosen panel. Every man is innocent till proven guilty, and from looks of things, here comes that unhappy verdict. Yes, there's a new inmate in the George, Junior Republic jail. On more constructive side, it's every youthful citizen for good of all, as government law demands that everyone have a job. This bakery is owned and operated by citizens of the Republic who do everything from knead dough to baking bread and delivering the finished product. Learning trade for later life, youths work on small Republic's dairy farm. This youth takes bull by the horns. And this bossy looks as if she's enjoying a lot of grade A contentment. And so is girl. Top day in George Junior Republic is payday, as citizens learn lessons in finance. In 1926, these young girls and boys have found fun in freedom. By 1936, they were wise citizens of the United States, freest, most wonderful land on earth. It's 1930, and here in Berkeley, California, is Mr. Stuart X. Yes, that's his last name, X. And it's without question, shortest name of anyone in world. As proof he can write, here's his signature. In Chicago, lived man with perhaps longest name on record. Cutting dough in the kitchen of his restaurant, he's just a guy named Joe, and his last name is the reason why. Here's his calling card. You pronounce that name, if you can. It's not Smith, and it's no wonder he's just called Joe. It's February 1927, and here at Vatican City, Rome, Italy, masters and pupils of the art of tapestry keep alive an art form that is centuries old. Deep in heart of Vatican, students of Papal School of Tapestry work at their hand looms. In process of becoming a work of art, tapestry looks like little more than crisscross of loose and unrelated threads. Slowly, the design begins to appear. Here in close-up is a small portion of the finished product. It's head of the Christ child, woven by students at Papal Tapestry School. And here's the entire completed tapestry, called the Birth of Christ, its modern miracle in ancient form of art. Here in 1931 is Lincoln Ellsworth. On White House lawn, great polar explorer is honored. As other dignitaries watch, Herbert Hoover gives medal to man who twice explored the Arctic and later claimed 300,000 square miles of till then undiscovered Antarctic territory for the United States. In 1920, here's Harry McLennan, better known as Sir Harry Lauder, returning to America after three-year absence. With Lady Lauder, the famed Scottish singer and entertainer is again going to tour the United States with his repertoire of songs and ballads, among them the immortal I Love a Lassie. Anyone
anyone who's ever studied the drama will know who this man is. Pictured on his arrival in New York City in 1922, he's the theorist and critic of the theater, Konstantin Stanislavski. Konstantin Stanislavski, to whom the whole world of the theater once bowed. It's 3rd of July, 1926, and here's aftermath of violent earthquake in East Indies Islands. This is all that remains of town of Padang in province of Panyong, Sumatra, where 300 persons are dead under wreckage and ruin of their fallen and flattened homes. Survivors are stunned by one of worst earth tremors in quake land. This is all that's left of Main Street of a once thriving native town. This building is a total loss, a pile of debris. It all happened in 1926, and it was years before many of the survivors forgot the horror of it. It's February 1926. And here's yesterday's look at recently discovered secret underground passages near Petersburg, Virginia. Built during war between the states, passages were chopped out of earth by bayonets, some still there. Altogether, the network of underground passages extends almost three miles, and some experts of here say that these might have been part of the famed underground railway used by Union soldiers. of January 1929 as 41,000 San Francisco bonds are signed. One of endurance signers is city's popular Mayor Rolfe, who puts his John Hancock on bonds thousands and thousands of times. City treasurer John Taylor puts his name on dotted line 28,453 times. After using two quarts of ink, Mayor Rolfe also gets a rest and rub down. What's it for? This, the beautiful Spring Valley Water Project, is the answer. City will buy the dam and reservoir, add it to San Francisco water supply, badly in need of expansion. Citizens bought signed bonds so city could buy water. April Fool's Day, 1928, as round the world flyers, Goebel, Coste, and Libri pause in capital city of the land of the rising sun to receive honor from emperor's people. Brave men from western world get a good impression of the east and a warm ovation as they say thanks to the little men of Honshu. A few years later, other airmen came to Tokyo, but didn't stay over Japanese soil long enough to make speeches. of 1926. It's 1926, and Miss Washington is one of leading entrants in Atlantic City, New Jersey's annual Miss America contest. One-piece suits, pumps, and short hair are the fashion for glamour. And looking over the contestants, we get a shock. For look who's here. We'll give you a longer look. Yes, you're right. It's none other than Joan Blondell. Will she win? Eighteen-year-old Norma Smallwood, who is in Atlantic City, is the promising Miss Tulsa of 1926. Five feet four inches tall, 118 pounds of beauty, Norma Smallwood is crowned Miss America of 1926. Hollywood-bound Miss Blondell didn't do half so well in pageant as in pictures. It's September 1925, and near Manchester, New Hampshire, super brownies are simply super. 
Here's Super Brownie Leon Sullivan, just a kid, dropping 65 feet into water. And no kidding, he should be voted youth most likely to make big splash in later life. Here's dive from 108 feet. And here's dive called the waterfall. Let's have a look at it in slow motion. At least we'll think they hit the water with a slightly softer touch. That's diving. Boy or man, that's diving. It's 1929 and horse racing comes back to Florida with reopening of Hialeah. W.P. Carey of Madison Square Garden is there with Jack Dempsey. And here are horses on way to starting gate for inaugural handicap. They won't be moving at this slow a pace next time they pass the grandstand, but this is one way spectators get a look at nags of their choice. And they're off. With race beginning on backstretch, clean play and stand by. Take an early lead and hold it. Rounding the far turn and driving toward the finish line, clean play and stand by are neck and neck. But clean play number four gets the winner's purse because his whiskers got there first. Thank <laughs> you.